are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. And joining me once again is Professor Richard Wolf. I always look forward to our conversations. Richard Wolf, as you probably know, is uh, an economist and an economic historian. He is a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts. He is a visiting professor at New York University. He is the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV and the author of a number of books, the latest of which is The Sickness is the System. So without any further ado, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, RJ. I'm very glad, as always, to be here. And we're very glad, as always, to have you. Richard Wolf. I've been thinking a lot lately about those things that are not quantified in that field we call economics, because it seems to me as we make more and more policy decisions based on the economics of option A versus option B, the economics of policy A versus policy B. We just had the head of the Congressional Budget Office, for example, talk about, uh, go before Congress to explain what this or that uh, policy will do to the economy, as is so often done on Capitol Hill. But, you know, we never have, and this may sound saccharine, but, but I mean it in all seriousness, we never talk about the economics of a beautiful sunset or seeing uh, the planets in the night sky on a summer evening or uh, dipping a, a child's toes into, you know, the clear water of a running stream or any of the other things that don't get measured in our so-called economic science. And yet we make so many policy decisions that affect all of these things, whether it's Elon Musk's uh, ambition to put thousands of satellites in the sky, obscuring the night sky stars, whether it's the pollution that alters sunsets, whether it is the pollution of our streams and rivers, and even human time itself, the way it's being uh, eroded by uh, the increasing levels of shadow work we have to do to, you know, file an insurance claim or the million other things we need to do. So I know this is an extremely broad topic, but I just wanted to start by saying, uh, do I, uh, I'm sure somebody will accuse me of being, you know, a kind of wild-eyed hippie here for even bringing it up, but, uh, Shouldn't we be able to make decisions based not only on the input-out system of economics, but on the quality of life for ourselves and other living things? Well, let me first assure you, as a professional economist, that this is a crucially important matter. It is and always has been part of economics, but its problem has been that it raises the kind of challenge to the capitalist economic system and to the culture that it has evolved that makes it almost taboo to bring it up. It makes people like you who see it feel as though somehow it isn't quite legitimate uh, to put it on the table so that we can all talk about it. Now, it's better than it used to be this problem because of the environmentalists and the ecologists, because they've been able, by keeping up the pressure, to get millions, maybe even billions of people on this planet to be aware that thousands, millions, excuse me, of decisions made by capitalists over the years in which they invested in this process or um, put into effect this technology or decided to produce that particular product and justified it by saying we did a cost benefit analysis we measured the costs of doing such a thing against the benefits and since the benefits were larger than the costs we went ahead and did it and we were right to do it because that's what efficiency means you do the things where the benefits are greater than the costs because that brings us to a higher or better stage of society the environmentalists have had a field day being able quickly and easily to show us that every one of those decisions, or at least 99.9% .9 of them, 
were phony, were fake, were, were not what they claimed because they didn't even know enough to ask what is the impact of producing this thing on the environment, on the temperature of the water in our oceans, on the composition of the gases in our atmosphere, on the fertility of the soil into which we dump the residue of, of producing these things. We never asked those questions. We never investigated. We never measured. We simply excluded. And that makes the calculation invalid. It, there is no way out of that. Here's what the economics profession has done. It has called these things, and you'll love the language because you understand language and what it does. These are all called in economics textbooks, quote unquote, externalities. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful world, word. In other words, it's out there. It's not with us. It's external. It's not internal to economics. But, but of course, that's the problem. That's what's stupid. If I can show you, which I easily can, that um, adding a technology to a dry cleaning factory that enables them to process 20% more uh, garments through the dry cleaning process, but emits into the air pollution that will kill thousands of children within a five mile radius, I don't think we'd have much trouble saying, hmm, that's a process, a technological process that we don't consider an advance. We don't consider its gains, 20% more garments cleaned, uh, greater than the cost, which is X thousand children dead or wounded or given asthma or whatever it is. So there it's easy. Well, I can do, I can give you millions of those. Let me give you a couple that will, I think, talk to just the point you bring up. A, an employer decides whether or not to fire Mary. Mary has been working for the employer for 10 years. She's been really working well, but she's getting on in her age and her fingers are not quite as nimble as they once were. All right, so he does. He invites a technical guy, maybe a person like me, a time and motion measuring man who comes in and says, yes, uh, Ma Mary's productivity here at the job is down about 10% because of her finger agility. On the other hand, she brings X years of experience that's very hard to quantify, but she kind of knows this business. She knows the mistakes we've made in the past. She's not going to make them again. She knows what works, what doesn't. She has relationships with people in other businesses that we do business with on and on. And we, we don't measure that part of her productivity because it's external to what's agitating the employer, which is, am I getting from Mary as much as I'm paying Mary? Or better yet, am I getting more from Mary than it's cost me to have her here? But I want to add one that you, I think, were heading toward. If you fire Mary, what is the cost? Well, the employer answers, uh, the cost is I got to go find someone else to do whatever it is Mary uh, had been hired to do. And so I'll have to pay somebody, you know, $40 an hour or whatever it is. That's the cost. Oh, no, it isn't. Here are the other costs you're not even thinking about you jackass, you know, because that, that, that's really what this is. Mary is going to be fired. Mary is now 59 years old. Mary is worried about getting old. Mary's worried about being a burden on her children. Mary's, you're going to agitate Mary's anxieties. You're going to make her life worse. You're going to give her all kinds of problems and her family as well. And, the, and she's the emotional center of the family. That's really going to upset her grandchildren, her nieces, her nephew. Some of them are going to have to go see shrinks to try to help them work through the depression, Mary. What's about that? Those are all costs. 
you, you employer. What do you think? They're not there because you don't count them? You think they're not there and real in this society? A depressed Mary and a distraught family will impact the shopping they do, the friends they have, the boyfriends, the girlfriends, the marriages, the educations, all of them. And unless you can show me, which you never can, that you have acknowledged all of them, identified all of them, measured in some sense, if that's even possible, that unless you've done all of that, don't tell me what you did is efficient. What you can tell me is it's profitable for you. You can get someone who doesn't have um, difficult fingers like Mary, pay them out what you paid Mary, and you'll be a little bit better off. It's good for you, Mr. Employer, but for the society as a whole, you've caused way more damage, disruption, pain, difficulty, than the gain you've gotten. You have really cost the community awfully. And if there was a justice in the world, and if we could sit down and talk about all the consequences of your firing Mary, we would not have capitalism. We would not allow an employer to be in the position to aggrandize himself marginally at the cost of wholesale suffering. When General Motors Board of Directors, 15 people got together and closed down Detroit to move production to Shanghai, to Mexico City, to Canada, that was profitable for them. And it, it took the population of Detroit from 2 million in 1970 to 700,000 today. They drove the majority of the people out of the city. The social cost, the disruption, the pain, the suffering, no one counts it. General Motors is not required to count it and not required to spend one nickel coping with it. Nothing, nothing. They have the freedom under our capitalist system to tell those workers, and they did it, don't come back Monday morning. This Friday is your last day here. Here's the famous pink slip. Get lost. We don't want to hear from you. We don't want to see you. And we have no responsibility to even look into. Look, if people want to understand why in America today, right now, we have a situation where the production of goods and services is going up so that our president tells us we have an economic recovery. But every survey of the American people will tell you we're miserable, we're taking more psychotropic drugs than we ever have, we're killing each other and one another with opioids, heroin, and, you know, it's out of control. People find to scratch their head, there should be no scratching, because this is a system that doesn't care, doesn't count, doesn't measure, and doesn't even understand the basic human wisdom of the question you use to open today's conversation. What about all those things that are crucial to our lives? I have a doctor, I go to him, and we have the same joke at the beginning. Uh, I say to him, how are you doing? He says, well, why do you ask? Well, I said, oh, you know, I want you to tell to me, you know, what's wrong with me, doctor? So I figure I'd be polite. I ask you. Well, he says, well, let me turn it around. How do you feel? I said, I feel pretty good. He said, that's the answer. He's a doctor. He could, if he were a jerk like an employer, tell me I'm going to look at your temperature and I'm going to look at your blood count and, you know, and that's it. No, 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 no. I don't live in my blood cells and I don't live in my temperature. I live as a total human being and what's going on in my head and what's happening to my relationships is every bit as important and every bit as important to shaping my physical health as well. So to ignore it is just, it, it's either stupid and my doctor and people like that aren't stupid or it's an ideological thing. I would argue it's an ideological thing. 
Capitalists want to be free to do what's good for them, but they don't have the courage or the honesty to say, we don't care about anybody. We're just here to make a buck. They, no, very few of them. They I would... I would have to I just, if you don't mind, uh, challenge you ever so slightly there, and that I think you're being a little too kind to capitalists on that one. Let, uh, but you know, obviously, tell me what you think. But let's go back to the case of Mary, right? Okay. So Mary is fired after, let's say, 30 years at a company. Maybe it was a startup when she began. She contributed to making a hundred million dollar company, but she wasn't a principal or an owner, so she gets let go, and she gets a little slow, and. Um, she goes out into society and maybe she has a depression problem or a drinking problem or something else. Maybe she doesn't find another job. She winds up in the welfare system. You multiply Mary by a million fold, million Marys out there of all kinds, all descriptions. Um, the same capitalist will come to you and me and talk about the productivity of the private sector as represented by his company and the drag on the public uh, on the economy represented by the public sector that has to support people like mary who have been discarded and cast away like refuse by their own system but they use it not to hang their heads in shame but to justify their own predatory behavior fair Absolutely. It's as American as baseball, apple pie, donuts, and coffee cups, or whatever else you can think of. Absolutely. It, it's, but you know, it's the same logic. I don't have to, if I don't have to count it, it doesn't exist. It's like a, for me, it's like the little toddler who goes out for a walk with her parents and they encounter a, a, a frightening dog who's barking. And it scares the little girl, understandably. And she does something wonderful. She puts her little hands in front of her eyes because she's a toddler and she hasn't yet learned that even if you can't see it, the thing can still be there. Our capitalists want us all to be stupid and to imagine that if they don't count it, if they don't care about it, well, it doesn't exist. We don't have to care about it either. Fundamental logical mistake. Capitalists don't want to pay for anything. Their job is to minimize costs. So if Mary is a human being and your morality says, she has given to us as a community her life, her initiative, her dreams, her hopes, her sweet words on a rainy afternoon. Well, when we owe her something, too, and that's not to treat her like a discarded piece of machinery. And if we take that that morality that we say on Sunday we care about, if we take it seriously, we would excoriate the employer who who fired her. Or even worse, who imagined that in firing her, nobody, especially him, has any obligation, any relationship, any commitment, any moral link to what happens to her. And then, of course, take it one step further. If there is, thank God, a community that will have a welfare system so that she literally doesn't expire at the side of the road... To, to complain that you, a tiny fraction of your tax was used to make that, you should have done it, you jerk. <laughs> and you should be grateful to the rest of us for compensating for your moral turpitude. And uh, let me give you a, a, an example from history of this uh, uh, that I'd like to get your thoughts on, which is... You know, I'm very, I've been very interested, especially in the last few years, studying those periods of history where change seemed possible in different parts of the world and either did or didn't happen or partially happened or happened and was undone. One of those periods, you know, if you look back at the enclosure movement in England, for example, in that general area, 
where the commons was used, people grazed their animals. And I don't mean to over idealize, idealize, but you know, you had a pastoral life built around the common grazing of animals, raising of crops, and so on. People had a nice way of life. I you know, read some historians about that. Some Marxist historians were actually the best on it. You know, Christopher Hill and uh, Hobbes Baum and some of the others. And and um, you know, then I read a critique of them, which said. Uh, you know, this was all wrong because when the enclosure movement came in and these lands were seized from common ownership, productivity uh, per hectare or hectare or however it's pronounced increased by what, 2.2 times. And for a moment, I was like, oh my God, I was wrong. My whole thinking about this was wrong. It's so more, much more productive to have a centralized top down. And then a part of me said, well, but. So what? We're not factoring in all those people who lost their way of life and then eventually like got fed into, you know, Moloch, the great machine of the Industrial Revolution. They had to go to London or Birmingham or Manchester and get their, you know, limbs crushed in these huge machines. And, you know, you have the critic Bayard Ruskin, Ruskin saying, no, I'm sorry, uh, John Ruskin saying, you can make a creature of the man, you make a man of the creature or a machine of him, but you cannot do both. You know, you have that whole dehumanization process. Where does that fit into the productivity increasing 2.2 times per hectare? And why, you know, how does one take the discipline of economics where that is like, oh, you just won the argument, buddy, uh, to like, no, that's not the whole picture. That's, you're not seeing life in its full dimensionality. Well, let me give you the answer because, you know, it's it's a part of, of, of what I teach as an economist, you know, trying to be a critic of, of the ideological far-fetchedness of mainstream economics. Here's the reality, and we can use the example of the enclosures. The two waves of enclosures across England, the common land that everybody had shared, was snatched and made the private property of a very small number of people who became owners of the land and who became, and here's what's crucial, very, very wealthy. Why did they become wealthy? Wealthy enough to dominate British society for centuries, the landlord class. Why did they become so wealthy? Well, they had taken the land away from the mass of people who became impoverished urban dwellers, literally driven off the land. Section 8 of Volume 1 of Marx's Capital explains it and describes it in a master of literary composition that that last Section 8 is if you ever want to see it, as well as the historians you mentioned and many others. They deprived those people of their animals, of their land, of their family, of their accumulated pots and pans and, and houses and everything else, drove them penniless into the city where they became the proletariat, which you can read about if you take pick up any Charles Dickens novel in the city. So the wealth, it was a wealth transformation operation. That's why the landlords did it. That's why they enclosed the land. They didn't enclose it because it was more productive. The reason modern economists focus on productivity is they're desperately trying to come up with something they can say about this awful social crime that killed huge numbers of people and disrupted the lives of millions. And you know what they came up with? Oh, wait a minute. Let's look at the amount of corn per acre that came out. Whoa, see? You know what this is like? This is like watching a beggar at the side of the street. And you're coming out of a very expensive restaurant where well, you've just spent more money on the evening meal than that beggar will see that year. And the man with you who said ugly things about beggars and how he wished Mayor Giuliani would be here and get rid of them again, as he says it with disdain written on his face, he throws the beggar two nickels that were in his pocket. 
and 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 you look at the situation and you get home to your home and your wife asks you what happened to you today and you say to her i saw a remarkable thing a wealthy man helped a beggar <laughs> whoa, whoa whoa what that's what you so you don't you know the, the marxists were wanting to talk about enclosures to get clear that the wealth amassed by ripping off the poor in the rural areas is the capitalist nest egg that starts the capitalist revolution in the cities. That's what Marx was writing about, Christopher Hill, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, all of them. And they documented it, and there it stands, and it hasn't been overturned. What you do have is a nice collection of well-behaved, docile history rewriters whose job it is to clean off the horrors of capitalism, to deny them, to prevent them. If they're there, make them smaller. They, therefore, think they're refuting Marxism because the productivity went up? You've got to be kidding. There are a hundred ways to make the productivity go up. They happen to choose the one that allowed them to become very, very wealthy and plunged millions of people into abject poverty. There are brilliant British novels that go through what it meant for a rural family that had access to common land to be shoved into Liverpool or Leeds or London or any of them and to live then the life chronicled by Dickens in the middle of the 19th century. They didn't want it. They didn't need it. It killed them in huge numbers. It made them sick in huge numbers. And again, to go back to the earlier point, if we ever, following the Marxists, really sat down to measure, well, we could see that millions were hurt and a very, very small fraction of them were helped. In the formal economics, here's how I do it. I say, okay, let's take a look at the rising productivity. It rose. Now let's take a look at the distribution of income. And then I hang them by their own argument because I show them that the overwhelming majority of the wealth created by rising productivity went into the hands of the richest people who needed it least. Then it becomes easier to show my students or any open-minded colleague the point and purpose of these things was to make rich people richer and the rest was collateral damage. You haven't refuted anything by showing me just like you haven't refuted the injustice of the two rich diners versus the beggar by noting that one of the rich diners dispensed with two nickels. Well, as Martin Luther King said, true charity is getting rid of the edifices that make beggars necessary. Um, but uh, let me. But you realize that what you're describing is a kind of psycho psychopathy, right? Be be because, I mean, let me give you my own example. I've campaigned for a long time for Medicare for all, or whatever you want to call it, uh, government run, government healthcare. And um, because I used to work in the private healthcare insurance field, it's among other things, the kind of living amends that I make. And yeah. one of my calculations, one of the counter arguments used was, well, but a million people work in that private health insurance industry, and you'd, you'd be costing a million people their jobs. Well, leaving aside the fact that we could have job guarantees or anything else, mm -hmm. do anything other than employ them in the new system, any other solution, there's a psychopathy to that because I did the math based on the most conservative estimate of the number of people who die from under insurance or lack of insurance. Every job costs uh, 200 lives a year or something. Yeah, I don't remember the exact number now, but, but, but it's horrifying. Maybe it's the other way around. Every 200 jobs costs a life per year. So that's Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, right? That's, okay, we're going to keep these jobs. I have to kill one person for each 200 of you. But that's what the numbers say to do. I mean, that's the system you're describing, I think. And that to me seems psychopathic, sociopathic. I'm not a clinician. I don't know which word to use, but it certainly seems.
Yes. No, it's it's the most deeply immoral thing imaginable. And and here's a little history to remind everyone that kind of prove it. Halfway through the 1930s, we're in the worst depression in the history of capitalism. There are millions and millions of people unemployed. Uh, and the, the government says we have to do something because the, the communists and the socialists and the CIO, and they're all yelling, you got to do something here. And we did. There's no problem in creating jobs. We created 15 million jobs after 1934 for 15 million people who would have been unemployed before. Here's the issue. We allow jobs to be held hostage to private profit-driven capitalists. The basic rule in capitalism is you get a job if and when a capitalist can make money off of giving you one. That's the game. Now, you can celebrate when you have a job. Oh, good, and the capitalist is making money, so I got a job. But if you're going to give him credit for, quote, unquote, giving you the job he uses to rip you off, well, then you got to give him blame when he doesn't. During the second half of the 1930s, no American, other than a few right-wing crazy capitalists, no American believed it was good or necessary or moral or anything else to have millions and millions of people without work. No one did. And they weren't willing to wait until a capitalist or a group of them saw enough profit in it to give you a job. So the government was called in and the government gave 15 million people a job, gave them the income, gave them the self-esteem that goes with all of that, and used those people to build our national parks that we visit as a nation every summer ever since that are considered treasures, which they are. They built the first ecological reclamation projects uh, the uh, AAA, the WPA gave a level of culture to the American hinterland that has never seen again since. We did wonderful things and provided people with jobs. If the only thing you can say to defend awful behavior is that, well, there are people with jobs, I can give you alternative jobs which will be so much better because not only will the per person have a job, but they'll actually do something useful for the community that gives them the job. Capitalism, and I say this now with a confidence I've never had before, American capitalism is exposed. It is not working for the vast majority of the people in this country. And the old arguments that would make people look the other way or run, go along, they're not working. It's because this country and its empire have peaked. We are on the downside like the British for the last half, uh, for the last century. And it's very hard, and I know everyone's tempted to denial. There we are, and we watch as the People's Republic of China rises up and unless we have a very new and different way of thinking in the world, they're going to be the next empire, as sure as the United States was the next one after the British. That's the reality. 15 million jobs in 1936. The country's what, two and a half, three times greater now? Yes. Uh, so that's could be like 50 million jobs now, 45 million. You know, pick your number. But if we can do something on that scale, in 1936, uh, surely we can do it today, right? Absolutely. And by the way, the timeliness of, of the example you bring up is true today. The basic liberal defense of all of that money that is spent on the military in our country, now approaching one trillion admitted dollars per uh, fiscal year, Liberals, they know the horror of it all. They know the corruption. They know that the military can't account in a normal audit for most of what it does. But their defense is 
gee, there's an awful lot of people working in the defense or the defense-related industries. I speak to, and I won't go, I won't mention names, although you can guess. I speak to senators and congressmen, and I, who I know agree that the defense budget is a, a is so outrageous it's hard to believe. I, I assume everyone here knows the United States admits to spending more on the military than the next nine countries together spend and those other nine include russia and china and then the rest of them are allies of the united states and therefore you know part of our military de facto through nato and so on there is no justification none for what we do in this country but i will tell you of, of countless people who vote annually for that defense budget and will tell you and say publicly I'm protecting the jobs of the people in my state or in my congressional district who work for this company, that company, whatever it is, who sells to the Defense Department, blah, blah, blah. It has become a kind of mantra. And these are the same people who will go to church on Sunday and, and listen to their minister approvingly explaining to them that morality means that you have to act in con in concert with what is right. If the Bible says thou shalt not kill, there have to be some consequences to that statement about, you know, the commandments you're supposed to live under, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we just, we can't. And it's the same self-delusional nonsense that we began with today rj that we don't count what it means to that people who have been rendered sick by some technology are not able to enjoy that morning the way you described it that impeccable sunset that the ability to talk to your grandchild about what it means to look at the moon and and all of the magic and, and the mystery that comes with it to not count that, that's not an achievement. That's a flaw. That's a failure. The least you can do is face up to it. We don't know how to translate that moment with your grandchild into dollars and cents on a spreadsheet. But that's like saying, I, I, no matter how hard I train, I can't leap over the Empire State Building. We've gotten over that. We all understand that no amount of training, no amount of running 100 laps is going to get us to jump over the Empire State Building. And, and still we sleep at night. We make a... Well, what's the problem? We can't quantify in dollars and cents an orgasm. Right. right? Or an epiphany or the greatest meal you ever had, or the most fantastic song anyone ever sang. You can't do that. And that, that's not a mistake. That's not, and it is never the grounds for pretending it's not there or that it doesn't matter. Modern capitalist economics has to do that because if you honestly put down what the costs in all the different forms and benefits of capitalism are, you'd come up with a very different calculation than the one that capitalists feel comfortable endlessly repeating. On that note, uh, we will conclude. Uh, thank you so much for a stimulating conversation. A sane society, like a sane person, should be able to uh, appreciate a beautiful day as much as, as well as it can uh, you know, count the nickels in its pocket. And uh, on that, uh, as always, thank you so much. My guest has been Richard Wolf, uh, economist, economic historian, host of Economic Update. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And as always, thank you for coming on the program. My pleasure, RJ. These are wonderful conversations. If either my uh, intensity gets to be too much, just calm me down. I'll be glad to, to back off. Oh, I can handle you. Don't worry. Uh, uh, very <laughs> okay. good. Take, Take care. Bye-bye.